we are going to hear from, uh, is that Abby? No, oh, okay. sure. No, um, we're going to hear from Joyce um, about S163. Is that right? No, it's one or seven. Oh, yeah. Speaking of this one, did anybody know that that was going to go back to the Not a quote. I talked to Tom. He said that some things had already passed. There were parts of it that had already passed. Well, that shouldn't matter. Would have been nice to know. Under. We had an amendment on the floor. Um, no. Oh, we did. Um, so does anybody have anything they want to, uh, any announcements anybody wants to make? Hi, mm -hmm. right. here. You're on the board. I've got an announcement. Yes. Bill. Canfield family has expanded. Baby Mary came on December 10th. Everybody's happy. Nice. Fantastic. Good In the pictures, you. you're going to, he, oh, he, oh, shows, yeah. he shows me pictures all the way through. I've got to want to see. That'd be good. Awesome. That's yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. Um, so we don't know. Oh, she's completely finished. <laughs> well, sometimes they come out and they're not, you know, or they're all red or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's just beautiful. Um, okay. So, um, oh, Abby, good. I stalled long enough for a bit. So, um, uh, everyone knows the really sad news that Peter left. Um, and I hope everyone knows the really good news is that Abby is going to be joining us um, right. in uh, the position that Peter had. So, I just wanted her to come in and say hello. Um, I don't, I think there might be a couple people on the committee who don't know you. Um, no. So, Nobody? No, I have never met you. Hi, yeah, I'm not shy. Welcome. Yeah, right. So, um, Abby was here as an intern uh, two years, three years ago? Uh, four years. Four years ago. And um, and then went to work for the tax department. Uh, so, and now she's back. So, anyway, so I'm thrilled. She'll be spending a lot of time with us, and I just wanted people to, to be able to say hi. Thank you, Abby. All right. Uh, so, Joyce, you've got some material, and we'll. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to be reminded what we passed on uh, paid leave, and we're going to look at what the Senate has passed over, and the um, report on the floor is going to come from the general committee, not from us. Um, although, if people want to know what we think, we'll. we'll Share that, but basically it's going to come out uh, from the general committee. And my understanding is that th there's going to be a conference committee. That that's sort of the plan. Um, so this will not be the last time we look at it. Okay. Thank you. For the record, I'm Joyce Manchester with the Joint Fiscal Office, and it's great to see everyone in 2020. Um, so I think we're going to start with the April fiscal note. And I think I, I sent you the more recent one that I just finished this morning. So we'll want to talk about so that. So Joyce, you're going to have to speak. I know you're talking with her. You yeah, have to speak up a fair amount because there's a blower back. Ah, okay. okay. It's not this one, Joyce. That's the April one. Another and I sent you one this I do morning. Have it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll f first do this one. Okay. And, and I'll then we'll this one up while you do it. Great. Thank you. So you may recall that the House passed H-107, paid family and medical leave. Uh, this fiscal note is dated April 9th. So I thought that I'd just run through this quickly to remember what the House passed, and then we'll move over to the Senate proposal of amendment, which happened at the end of May. Um, and it's a little bit different, and we'll talk about how it's different. Okay, so this is a family and medical leave insurance program. The, the leave weeks, are as follows, as passed by the House, up to 12 weeks of parental or bonding leave, and remember that applies to births, but also adoptions and, and so forth, and that's 12 weeks per parent. And we'll see a difference when we get to the Senate version. Up to eight weeks of own medical leave or family care leave, and again, we'll see a difference uh, in the Senate, they made the medical leave voluntary. 
So each employee. And med medical leave is what we sometimes call TDI, TDI or yes. own leave yes. or whatever, just to sure. make sure it's sure. um, I had this opportunity to have a meeting on this yesterday, so I'm remembering some of it, but I'm guessing there are people on the committee who are not remembering any of it. So sure. we're Feel free to ask questions. Yeah. Um, so the maximum leave is 12 weeks in a 12 month period, and that's if bonding is involved. And you would have the 12 weeks. Uh, the benefit amount, remember the benefit amount back then was linked to the Vermont livable wage. And the Vermont livable wage comes from JFO. So every two years, we sort of estimate how much it would cost for different households to live in Vermont. So that used to be <laughs> what we pegged the benefit to. And we'll see that there's a difference when we get to the Senate version. But this was 90%, a person would receive 90% of their average weekly wage up to the Vermont livable wage, which was about 533 a week, 27,700 a year. And then 50% of the employee's average weekly wage over that amount. Okay, so it's sort of tiered uh, progressively. And the maximum weekly benefit amount that any person could receive was 2.5 times the Vermont livable wage, which turned out to be about 13.34 per week. All right. How did the funding work? We had payroll contributions based on wages up to the Social Security taxable maximum, which was 132.9, 132.900 in 2019. That's increased a little bit, and we'll see that in 2020. Um, point. 1% of wages for six months before benefits begin to cover the administrative costs, and then 0.55% of wages once benefits begin to cover 55 million um, in FY 2021 and 76 million in benefits yeah. over a year. So just to remind people, so so there was a there was a transition um, payroll tax, of 0.1, mm -hmm. right? And then it was 0.55 for the fully implemented program. Is right. that right? Right. Okay. Right. Yes, and the employer had the option of paying some or all of the contributions due, and that's still going to be true in the Senate version. Uh, mechanics of the funding: the employer would remit the payroll contributions quarterly to the Department of Taxes. The legislature would set the contribution rate annually. So the legislature would get a report every January. Um, about the financial status of the program. It doesn't expire at the end of the year. It's just it doesn't change unless right. the legislature comes in and changes it. Correct. OK, what about the administration? The Vermont Department of Financial Regulation will issue a request for proposals to select an insurance carrier. So remember, we were using the third party administrator. An insurance carrier would run the program if a program that meets the goals of the legislation in a more cost-effective manner than a state-run program. Remember, we were seeing quite large administrative costs coming out of the Department of Labor and also out of the Department of Taxes in order to set up the program and then keep it going over time. Um, there are also employer opt-out rules that had to be written. So if an employer already or proposed to offer a paid family leave program that was equivalent to or better than the state rent program, then the employer could just opt out and the employees would not have to pay this contribution rate. Okay. The Department of Vermont Department of Labor would write the rules regarding the appeals process. So if, if your benefits were denied for some reason and you didn't agree, you could appeal that decision. They would carry out marketing, which means letting people know about the program and, and making sure that people could sign up if, if they were eligible, and handle any appeals that come to the state. I think that's uh, redundant. Oh, handle the appeals that come to the state. OK, fine. Next page. OK, the Vermont Department of Taxes will collect the payroll contributions from employers on a quarterly basis and remit them to the FNLI special fund. So all the, all the contributions go into the special funds, and then the monthly premiums paid to the insurance carrier come out of that special fund. Uh, I just said that. The special fund would earn and retain any interest on the balances. OK, what about state budget impacts? Are there any questions? 
You're, you're just going over the house version. Yes, this is all house. Yeah, and then we'll move on. Yeah. Okay, expenditures in FY 2020. The Department of Taxes asked for a million dollars to develop software for collecting contributions. The Department of Labor, 217,900 for rulemaking and administrative tasks. So that was all calculated. In so when you say fiscal 2020, that was assuming the Under bill the passed bill last year. Bill, and right. so um, everything would move up. Everything's going to move up, no, ma no matter what, um, if you change the dates. Yes. Yeah. Okay. For state employees beginning in last, this fiscal year, FY 2020, <coughs> The maximum all fund appropriation need, if the employer pays the entire contribution, is approximately 158,000 in FY 2020 and 2.86 million in FY 2021. So um, the program was supposed to start in April of 2020, so there would be just one quarter in FY 2020. At 1%. At 1%. At 1%. Right. I'm sorry. Right. right. Uh, and then uh, FY2021 would be the full year. Yeah. And about 40% of that cost would fall in the general fund. So in addition to those direct costs, there may be costs to replace state workers who take longer leaves or costs associated with leaves with relatively new employees who haven't built up their sick leave or paid time off um, who might be eligible for longer leaves. So there could be additional costs. Uh, HR, the HR department couldn't tell us exactly <coughs> what estimate that might be. Um, other indirect impacts, any employer contributions for public school employees or contract workers, home health and hospice workers, could indirectly affect the state budget as well if they're taking leave that they didn't use to take. Okay, what about effective dates? This was effective on passage back in May, I guess. Rulemaking, making it on passage. Payroll contributions were to begin April 1st, 2020. Benefits were to begin October 1st, 2020. And again, this will all be pushed out. Any questions on that? That's the House passed version. Okay. Um, now, we have a choice. We could move right to the brand new fiscal note, which is based on the Senate proposal of amendment. And we can talk about uh, using the statewide average weekly wage uh, rather than. The I think you should go through the wage. Senate amendment first okay. and then, and then go to the details. Yep. Okay. okay, great. So we now want the January 7th. Yeah. Great. Excellent. Oh, you're doing the fiscal note. Okay. The fiscal note is that okay. okay. Rather than the comparison. Okay. You want to go through the comparison first? Comparison first. Should we do the Well, I was thinking it would be helpful sure. to go through the yeah. Yeah. elements yeah. first. Yeah, um, yeah that's great. And, and that was the only place I found them, but yes. maybe they're all square. Yeah. Um, okay. So let's first look at as past the house, <laughs> since we just talked about all those provisions. So you can see I've got this little shorthand description of the bill up at the top. So it was 12 weeks for bonding eight weeks for family care, eight weeks for own medical care, sick leave. Wage replacement was the 90-50, 90% up to something and 50% above that. Maximum benefit was 2.5 times the Vermont local wage. Okay. Um, so we've got the maximum weekly benefit of 1334. We've got, according to the modeler, remember we had a modeling friend in Washington, D.C. who was helping us figure this out. According to the modeler, if people were offered eight, up to eight weeks of own medical leave, on average, they would take 6.6 .6 weeks. So that's what we were seeing in the nationwide numbers. The bonding parental benefit across men and women was 8.5 weeks. So you can guess that women were likely to take more and men were likely to take less. The family care benefit, 4.2 weeks. Um, and then we have the costs, and for this, we rely again on the modeler who tells us, you know, a person of such and such salary would likely take how many weeks, and you add all those up, and you get the costs. So it was about 41 million for the medical benefit, about 25 million for bonding, about 4.7 million for family care, and that brings us to a total benefit cost of about 71 million dollars. 
the administrative costs, and these are estimates, of course, because we don't know exactly what the third party would charge, but we have an idea. So the administrative costs are about 6.6 .6 million, leading us to a total cost of about 77 and a half million dollars. Vermont taxable earnings in FY 2021 were projected to be 14 billion. That's the total wage base. So. Yes, okay. total wage. No, uh, that's taxable earnings, so that's under the Social Security maximum. That's still wages. Absolutely. We're not talking about <coughs> non wage income. Absolutely. Okay. It's all wages up to the Social Security taxable maximum. Mm -hmm. And cost as a percent of taxable earnings was 0.55%. Okay. And now uh, we can move over to the Senate proposal of amendment. So, we had, um, huh. so the change here is that we had 12 weeks for bonding or parental leave, but a 16 week limit per couple. Okay, so if there were two parents with one baby, together they could take no more than 16 weeks. And in the house it would have been 24. Yes. Okay. And we now, well, D Damien tells us that that may be unconstitutional because it's treating people differently depending on their marital status. Uh -huh. uh, and when I asked the modeler in D.C. To, to, to help us with this, he had never heard of this before, and maybe that was a clue. <laughs> okay. Well, well we have, I mean, the common benefit clause is unique to Vermont, but my humble opinion is it's a bit of a stretch. Okay. Anyway. Okay. But it's, it's an issue we're not going to deal with in here. Right. Um, okay. What's a bit of a stretch? To say it's a problem? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Not, not, not going to be my decision. No, no, I just yeah. wanted to know what you meant. Yes. Right. right. So uh, we stay at eight weeks for family care. And then the big change is that own medical leave moves to a voluntary benefit. So, you, so not everybody has to pay for that own medical leave benefit. You can opt in as an employee. And Each no. individual can hmm. opt in. Um, and if you opt in, then your employer has to support, you know, collecting the contributions and so forth for you. Um, I assumed 40% participation, and that is based on how many people already have sick leave through their employer that is relatively uh, you know, similar to this or more generous, um, and also on uh, some nationwide information about how many people opt into this, this sort of program. Um, the wage replacement is, is now 97. I'm going to stop you there just because mm -hmm. I remembered it wrong. I thought the opt-in was the employer. I didn't realize ah. it was by employee. I just want to find that in my own brain. In the Senate um, version. Yeah, yeah, the Senate version. By so individual. as an employer, you might have one employee that's in and another employee that's not in. Yes, right. and okay. you may also be thinking that an employer can opt out if they have... Yeah, that one I know. <coughs> right. Yeah. Are better. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So the opt-in is employee by employee. Yes. Okay. Um, so wage replacement uh, is a little bit more generous above the cutoff. It's now not 55% above the cutoff rather than 50% under the first bill. And the maximum benefit has moved to be the statewide average weekly wage. So that is a number that is published by the Vermont Department of Labor yearly. And um, it turns out to be a little bit lower than 2.5 times the Vermont livable wage. And we can see those numbers uh, in, in a minute if, if you'd like. So the Vermont average weekly wage is $964. Um, and that was released in April of 2019. So, so that's actually a, quite a lot lower. You said a little <coughs> lower. It's yes. quite a yeah. bit lower. It's not going to catch up. No, 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 no. no. It's going to stay lower. No. Okay. But <coughs> yep. Um, our thinking was that it's it's um, it's probably more stable because the livable yeah. wage bounces around depending on assumptions and so forth. Yeah, uh, Sam. So the both versions have a, have a well, parental bonding leave will take an average of eight and a half weeks. So they there's no actual savings from the 16 week limit. Is that? It's very limited. Uh, because it turned out that the average was 8.5 and wouldn't change much with the 16-week. Actually, I, I was looking at these numbers, and if it were a 14-week maximum, it would have a, a squeezing uh -huh. effect, but at 16 weeks, it didn't seem to so matter much. Administrative. Yes. Yeah. 
And then I, I want to be clear about this maximum um, benefit. It, well, not maximum, but, but it's 90% in the Senate version. 90% up to what? It's 90% up, was 90 up to, to the, the employees. It's 90% of the employee's average weekly wage up to 55% of the Vermont average weekly wage, which is 530 per week. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's, that's missing it. a piece. Mm -hmm. Start, start that so ours was 90% up to the Vermont livable wage, and then 50% of your salary beyond that. Mm -hmm. up to With the an max. absolute cap. Yeah, up yep. to the max. So there's three pieces. This, but on the Senate side, it's 90%. All it says here is 90% slash 55 max. Right, there are two 55s running around. Okay, so it's 90%. 90% of what? Of your employee, your own average weekly wage up to 55% of the Vermont statewide average weekly wage, which is a fixed number. So, so that's way lower than up to 55% of the... Yeah, right there. Uh, 964. <laughs> that's the maximum. That's the maximum yeah. weekly debt benefit is 1334 in our version and 964 in the Senate version under current, the, under 2020, right? Uh, 2019 right. figures. Right. This threshold is about the same as it was using the livable wage, and we—that's why we use the 55% of the statewide average weekly wage. So. In the old days, under the Vermont, up to the Vermont livable wage, it was twenty-seven thousand seven hundred forty-seven per year. Okay. Uh, that would be your average. That would, that would be your annual earnings. That's the ninety percent. Oh. No, no, no. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, and now it is uh, ninety percent up to fifty-five percent of the Vermont statewide average weekly wage, which is 27582 so it's very, very close to the same threshold. I ain't getting it, because this says the average weekly wage is $964. That's the maximum. So, 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 the so let's, average. yes, yeah. I have, I have a page that will show you many numbers that might help you. I think, I think we need to see the Wage replacement in the House version, 90 and 50, and of, of what? And then the maximum benefit, which is two and a half times of what? And the same thing on the Senate side. We're, we're, you know, we're missing a piece when we're comparing them somehow. Sorry. I don't know what we're missing, but I know that one right. has three things and the other has two. Right. So in the House version, it was 90% of your own average wage up to the Vermont livable wage. Two and a half times. No, nope. no, nope. nope. that's the maximum benefit that anyone oh. can get. But, right. but, it, but the 50% is? The 50% is over, any earnings over that Vermont livable wage, back in the House version, uh, you would get 50% of your own Up earnings. to the maximum. Right. Up there's there's the three maximum. pieces. There's the 90%, there's the 50%, and there's the cap. And we need to see that both in the House What's version the and in the so Senate version. Said. It's right here. It's 90% of your own wages up to a different threshold, which is now 55% of the Vermont statewide average weekly wage. You're, you're skipping the 50% again. No, and 50% of additional wages above that threshold until you get to the cap of um, $964 a week. It's the same, it's the same structure. It's 90% up to a threshold. And 50% of your earnings. Yeah. Oh. So I think in the House version, it was 90% up to the Vermont livable wage. There was no other percentage in there. It was a straight 90% of the uh, up to the Vermont livable wage and right. then 50 over. But what you're adding is another percentage. You're saying 90% yep. of the to. weekly wage, but not up to the um, Average yeah. weekly wage, but you're saying up to 55 percent of the average weekly wage. That's the extra piece that's in that brings yes. it down. No, 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 no. It brings it to about the same threshold. <laughs> Remember, I, I just, I just offered the the threshold. So the old yeah, threshold was 533 dollars per week, and the new threshold is 530 dollars per week. 
It's just that we're using a different measure. But you're saying 55% 55% of, of the statewide average weekly wage equals $530. So that's the threshold. So you get 90% of your own earnings up to $530. If you earn more mm -hmm. than $530 per week, you get now 55% of your own earnings above that threshold. But the, but the, the, with the cap. With the maximum. With the cap. With the cap. The My problem is you're using the term up to twice, um, and it's it's graduated up to a cap. Up to it a cap. Is what, what it cap is what it is. So there's 90%, then 50%, yes. and then a cap. Um, Yes, but it's now 90% and a 55%. I, I'm talking just the house we're okay. just trying to yep. get grounded in one of them. Yep. Um, and so it's 90%, 50%, and a cap. And then the Senate version is 90% of something else, or 90% of something, 55% of something, up to a lower cap. Yes, absolutely. The, those are the... I'm not sure what I'm multiplying by. But I think it's really the cap. Are, it's it, the cap that's it, doing it. it it's, the cap is yeah. the big difference. Yeah. So when you're using the term up to, that sounds like a cap, and it's not. It, there's only one cap on each of them. Okay, I'm using yeah. the word threshold for the middle middle piece. Yeah. Okay. And the cap is the I think I'm over on that. Okay. Are, are, are people good? getting it? I don't know. I'm not sure they are. Uh, are, are we good? Okay. You just got it. I think I need an okay. example. I still don't know exactly what they're multiplying by, but what's key is that the Senate version, the absolute maximum, is quite a bit lower, yes. right? And what right. that means is that people on the lower end of the income scale are getting a proportionately higher benefit, right? Right. right. Yeah. Even though they're not getting the own medical leave, oh. but what of what they're getting, they're getting a proportionately higher benefit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Questions? <Anything? coughs> Let me make sure that I understand. You want to hear it again? The Vermont average weekly wage, $964. That is currently the Vermont average weekly wage. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that changes every April. Okay. Yeah. That's your cap. That's the cap. That's the yeah. absolute cap under the Senate version. Yeah. And it is the weekly, current average. weekly average wage. Yes. Sam. So oh, how could it be? How can that at 964? Oh, never mind. Got it. Got it? It's like, Sam. Is that a pre tax number? That would no. seem like it would be. That was, the, do you remember we went through all the stuff about what's next and what is Well, isn't? that's why we went with the 90% number, right? But I just, yeah. the, the average weekly wage seems like that would be a pre tax. Pre tax. Pre -tax. Pre -tax. You mean the, the actual average weekly wage is gross earnings? Gross earnings. Right. Yeah. Pre, and pre tax dollars. Yeah. yeah. I assume. Right. Could people sort of get, I mean, the, the thing that I, I remember lower looking Thursday. at this is that it was better for lower income people. Um, not by much, but by some. And which, I don't see how it's better. I see how it's worse for people that are making more. But I don't see how it's, <laughs> it's better. It's 55%. Relative. As opposed to 50. Okay. Not by much. Okay. But it's 90% of something smaller. No, no, no. It's 90% of your own Your own wage. Your own In earnings. both cases. Until your own earnings get to $530 a week. Used to be five hundred and thirty-three dollars a week, so that threshold is about the same. That place where it hits the second tier. Yes. However, you however you want. That's right. an easier way for me to think about it. So, first tier is ninety percent, um, and that's your own wage in both cases. In both in both cases, the second percentage applies to your own wage. It's fifty-five percent in the Senate version, fifty percent in the House version, and the cap in the Senate version is effectively lower because we've pegged it to something that's smaller. Correct. Right. Is that right? Correct. Good. Okay. Now, if we go down the column, you can see that own medical benefit is fewer weeks because we're limiting it now to 
up to six weeks rather than up to eight weeks, so it's 5.2 weeks. The bonding is about the same, 8.5 weeks. Family care benefit is the same, 4.2 weeks. So the, the 5.2 in the Senate version is the um, number of weeks for the people who are taking it. It's not an average of people who take it and don't take it. No, no. It's for, those the, it's for those who take right. it, it's 5.2 weeks. Okay. Yes. And that's the opt-in. Yeah. That's voluntary. Yes. Yep. Yes. Interesting. Okay. And then we have the cost in terms of benefits. So the own medical benefit turns out to be about $20.4 million. Bonding is $22.6 million. Family care is $3.7 million. Um, total benefit cost. You can see I've separated out now the mandatory benefits, bonding and, and family well, that's care, what I thought was a from the voluntary benefits, which are the, are the okay. sick leave. Okay. Uh, and then we have administrative costs. I've put all of the sort of setup and mm -hmm. administrative costs under the mandatory programs because you have to have all that medical stuff <coughs> in place in order to do the family <coughs> care because family care is taking care of sick relatives. So you have to verify that, that they are seriously sick and so forth. So there are some running costs associated with the voluntary sick leave, but the startup is all placed under the mandatory programs. So total cost comes out to be 29.7 million mandatory programs, 22.2 million voluntary programs. And again, we're looking at the same taxable earnings, and the uh, contribution rate would be 0.2% for the mandatory program, so everybody would pay 0.2%. And if a person signed up for the sick leave, they would pay 0.38%, or a total of 0.58%. <coughs> so the cost. So I'm wondering why it's such an additional jump for the TDI when I look at the cost of the own serious medical benefit being 20.4 million, but the parental is 22.6. Is it is it just because it's just generally more expensive? So you can see, let's. You can see that under the house version where it was mandatory and everybody got eight weeks or yeah. six weeks, it was forty-one million, right? And now we've moved down to six weeks, and I'm assuming that only forty percent of people take it, take the sick leave. But I'm also assuming that the forty percent who take it are likely to use more of it. Well, actually, it's less. I think. They, are, they can only use 5.2 weeks rather than 6.6. Yes, .6. because we limited the max to 6 weeks. Right, so the percentage of, it's using closer to the 6, to the amount <coughs> given. Yes, yeah. and more I people see. will use it. Yeah. Right? And what did what did you assume usage under the House passed? You said 40% usage under the no, no, Senate. I mean, by, by usage, I mean how many people opt in to, the, to, to paying for the benefit. Oh, not usage. Okay. Not usage, no. <coughs> Um, so I have to rely on the modeler uh, for help on um, you know, how many people use it. And there's an adverse selection factor as right. well, which means that those who use it will be more costly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That was our so concern. There are two, two things going on. They're more likely to use it, and they're more likely to have longer right. sick leave. No. Um, so it is more expensive per person who is enrolled to do it on a voluntary basis because of adverse selection. Questions? Anyone has? Okay. Good? Mm -hmm. well, we're good enough. <laughs> <laughs> shall we shall we look at the fiscal note? I think that'd be good. Okay. Yeah. Let's look at the the new January seventh fiscal note. Here we are, and I wrote this fiscal note based on the May 24th Senate proposal of amendment, 
And these are again based on the old dates and the old numbers, the 2019 numbers. Okay. So this has not been updated to 2020 going forward or $23. I'm sorry, what's not I thought. Oh, the, I'm sorry, this is, this is so center. at some point we'll update, but not here. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This is the fiscal note for the Senate version that we just looked at. Correct. Correct. So, again, we're at 12 weeks of parental bonding leave, maximum 16 weeks per couple with no waiting period. Um, both family care and voluntary medical leave have a five-day waiting period under the Senate Proposal of Amendment. So that's a bit of a change. Um, you get up to eight weeks of family care leave, but only after you've been out for five days. Okay. And we had no waiting period in the house? There was no waiting period in the house. Jim. Yeah. Do you recall their logic in a five-day waiting waiting period? Um, to say. Mm -hmm. It's like, I was just saying it's not for her to say their logic. Oh, yeah, understood. Do you recall the discussion? Can <laughs> um, I ask that? Is that okay? That is, that's good. Well, she doesn't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Say whatever she wants. Uh, there was discussion. Yeah. And. Um, Thanks, answer. <laughs> so, so they felt that if a person is out sick for a day or two with the flu, okay. All right. that shouldn't that's, qualify. That's, but if they're out for, you know. Yeah. Two weeks or that's sufficient. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the, the waiting period, the five calendar days waiting period, you don't get the leave going back to that time. No, you, no, you, it's unpaid. The, that's un, unleave covered, or whatever you want to call right. it. Right. Not paid. Okay. Although you might have had six days or vacation days. Right. 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 But this yeah. this program. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Um, and it's interesting, um, if, if an employee opts in to the voluntary medical leave, they have to opt in for a minimum of three years, and that's to avoid some of this adverse selection. Yeah. Yeah. After three years, they can choose annually whether to renew or not. Yeah. That's cool. um, and, and again, the maximum leave for all types of leave in a 12-month period is 12 weeks. Okay, here's the benefit amount written out. So it's 90% of the employee's average weekly wage up to 55% of the Vermont average weekly wage, which is $530 per week. And then above that threshold, it's 55% of the own weekly wage up to the limit of the maximum weekly benefit, which is $964 a week. The statewide average weekly So the max that anybody could get is 964. So uh, um, this, a worker earning at or above 73,580 gets the maximum benefit. Mm -hmm. What's the comparable figure in the house to that 73,580? Uh, well, I can't figure that out, but it takes a little I, bit of I think it was about 113,000. It was more. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was around that. Yeah. Do you remember 113? Yeah. That, that's okay, we can do that. But I think it's around that. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Any questions anyone has? No. Okay. Funding. Payroll contributions. Again, based on wages up to the Social Security taxable maximum, which is now 137700 And it's sort of interesting, that taxable maximum is indexed to average wages in the U.S. economy. And those are growing faster than... Um, Vermont's average wages. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yes, that's going to rise faster than the, the average wage in Vermont is going to rise. Um, for the mandatory benefits, an employee would pay 0.2% of wages that was supposed to be in the first 2020, and that amounts to about $29 million. For the voluntary benefits, that's 0.38% of wages, again, beginning April 1st. 2020, and that amounts to about $22 million for the 40% who are assumed to opt into the system. The employer has the option of paying some or all of the contributions due, or the employer may deduct the full amount from the employee's wages. So that's completely up to the employee. Uh, I'm sorry, up to the employee. 
the employer does have to send the total pay payroll contributions quarterly to the Department of Taxes. There is an option for the program administrator, this insurance company, to collect the contributions directly if, if they choose to do so. And again, the legislature may change the contribution rate each year. Okay, good. All right, now we'll move on to administration, which is a little bit different here. Now we have more uh, collaboration among various departments. So the Commissioner of Financial Regulation, in consultation with Commissioners of Human Resources, Labor, and Tax, will issue a request for proposals to select an insurance carrier to run the program. And that insurance carrier must run the program at a lower cost than a state-run program. Okay, so that is in the bill. And if no lower cost carrier is found, then the state will administer the program. And we'll see later that that decision would delay all the dates of implementation by a bit because it's going to take time to set up all the software and all the... But it wasn't a long, it wasn't like a year's was, delay, it was months, right? It's, so uh, we'll they, they remember. <coughs> Benefits would begin July 1st, 2021 instead of October 1st, so it's a nine month delay. Nine months. Okay. Yeah. Okay, the Commissioner of Financial Regulation will adopt rules for approval of an employer's alternative insurance or benefits plan that allows the employer to opt out. So that's if they have an existing uh, plan and it's equivalent or better, then they can opt out. The Commissioner of Labor will and adopt. This is all the same as in the House bill. Uh, pretty much, yeah. 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 The Commissioner of Labor does eligibility, appeals, education efforts. Right. And Commissioner of Taxes still does collection and remits them to the special fund. Special fund can earn interest, right? Same. Okay, good. Uh, state budget <coughs> impacts. So again, Department of Taxes would get a million to develop software for collection. The Department of Labor would get the same amount, 217900 for rulemaking and administrative tasks. Um, now here I gave an example for state employees beginning FY 2020 uh, in April. So the employer would pay 0.1% of wages, so that's half of the 0.2, right? So that would be 152,000 in FY20 and 628,000 in FY 2021. And again, those years would have to move forward if the bill were passed this session. And it's still the case that 40% of the cost comes from the general fund. And again, there may be additional costs for additional leave, longer leave, blah, blah, blah. And again, we have other indirect impacts on the budget. Okay, effective dates again, effective on passage, rulemaking can begin on passage. Payroll contributions begin April 1st or July 1st if there's no private carrier found. And benefits begin October 1st or July 1st, 2021, the next year, if no private carrier is found. And now on this, um, if there are no questions. Well, so are those the same dates that we had in the House? The April 1st, October 1st. Mm -hmm. uh, no, the, I'm thinking more if there's no private carrier. I don't think the House bill was explicit about okay. what happens. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And the Department of Labor in particular tells us that this would be a big stretch for them if there were no. We think they're going to find a private carrier. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. but they're, they're mm -hmm. delaying the, the benefits for an entire year, mm -hmm. right? I mean, nine yeah. months from October. No, I'm March. sorry, but right, a year yeah. from what we have, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if anyone wants to see all the nitty gritty numbers, I've attached the um, spreadsheets. Yeah, exactly. I don't think we need to go through them unless there are questions. But um, the, the, the one thing you may not have seen before is in lines 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, the treasurer's office was getting nervous about the cash flow coming in and out of the special fund. And so I actually took the time to look at each month's premium payment to the insurance company and when the collection of the 
payroll contributions was coming in to find the months in which there was a deficit or a big surplus or whatever. And the treasurer's office has scrutinized those those numbers um, with some interest. So that's that's all that business. They they think they can handle this. They were worried about big millions of dollars in the red that would present a problem, but they thought that this looked pretty good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? Anybody? Okay. Is there one more sheet? Or the one more sheet imagine? is the detail about um, the different measures mm -hmm. for setting mm -hmm. the benefits. So it compares the Vermont livable wage to the Vermont average weekly wage. Mm -hmm. And it might be worth just taking a quick look so that I can point out the, the critical numbers here. So if you look at the first line in the box, it says Vermont livable wage 2018, and that, that was announced in 2019, right, once they had the data. So that is $533.60. Okay. So does that get announced January 15, 2020? Under one? So I thought when I looked at it recently that it was announced. Oh yeah, the Vermont, no, so, sorry, I'm getting confused. So that's the Vermont livable wage that's um, estimated by JFO, and that's done every two years. So it won't be updated until next January. A good reason not to use it. Yes, yeah. Yeah. yes, okay. right. And then if you go down below, you'll see the Vermont average weekly wage in 2018. In the box yeah. still, second We're from the bottom. And you can say, see that that is $964.40, right? So we wanted to get something close to that $533.60. And that's why we chose the 55% of the Vermont average weekly wage, which turns out to be $530.42. Pretty darn close. Okay? So that's why the switch. Okay. Are there any questions about that? The, the maximum benefit is the $964, just the straight average weekly wage statewide. Um, good. Um, right. And other states use the average weekly wage. Is that right? I'm just looking yes, at the absolutely. very bottom there. That's, that's sort of standard. Yes, New York, Washington, Massachusetts, and they're in their They are statewide average But they have a different um, set of percentages. Right. Yeah. 60, well, so they're, they, they're, they're around 60%, 50%. So, uh -huh. yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But isn't the real difference here where they put the cap? Because they put it at the average weekly wage, you could have put it at two and a half times if you wanted to be closer to the, or two times or something. I mean, that's the thing that's making the difference. You're just, you're using a different measure of the wages, but the the thing that's making the Senate proposal different right. is that they're not doing two and a half times. They're doing, they're just taking. And in the large average. part, that's because they looked at these other states' Thanks. maximum right. Yeah. benefit. Right. I'm yeah. just, I'm just saying, what's making anyway. the difference yes. is that yes. they're putting that cap there, whereas. The House version was two and a half times. We had a higher cap. We had a we had a higher livable wage, and then we made it two and a half times. Well, the so, high, the livable wage was actually lower. The, the livable yeah. wage was lower, but we had it two right. and a half it's times. Right. So, right. Yeah. Right. But it but it does make sense to use the average it, weekly. It wage. It does make sense. It does make sense. It's yes. updated every yes. year. Yes. Um, That's not what's doing the work. Yes. Making it different. It's the cap. Yeah. Right. So right. Because you can set a cap at one and a quarter, or you sure. can set a cap yes. at whatever exactly. you want. Yes. Exactly. That was my point. That yes. that changing the measure of the wage makes perfect yes. sense if you're going to do this. What's making the Senate thing different is they have a different cap. That's what's making it different. Right. Yeah. It, it could go down though, as well, whereas the cost of living will always keep going up, right? Like. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. You could have well, deflation. deflation. Yeah. Right. Deflation. We haven't had it since 19, 1952, but you could have it. Mm -hmm. And in theory, the livable wage could go down. That's right. If we had Easily. costs going down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there are no good data, really, exactly. for the livable wage, so we're sort of 
picking at whatever we can find. So um, yeah, it, it does bounce around. Okay. Are there um, any other uh, questions? Aren't you all glad that we're back working with this again? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I now understand the Senate proposal, which I yeah. right. 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 Um, slightly off topic, but I'm in the meantime, the federal government has passed a paid family leave for federal workers. Federal did, workers. You, did you look at that at all? Or just in terms of what they did? I'm just curious. So I believe it's 12 weeks for bonding. And mm -hmm. I, is it more than that? Is it? I don't think I don't so. Think they so. already have sick leave and they already have family leave. Okay. It's possible it's for family <coughs> so this is this is for their own employees. For federal employees. Yeah. Um, what is worth uh, um, let's stop here for a second on is the uh, state employee uh, agreement that right. has been reached. Yeah. Uh, not that? not so funded that is, by the legislature yet, but it's but as it's, I understand it's it's on, right? been agreed to. Yeah. So that is six weeks leave. But I don't know. I know we don't have very many of them. But what would happen to? Federal workers that are residing in Vermont well, we can't do anything to them anyway. They're we federal. Can't, right. We can't tax. We can't do anything to them. Uh, well, sure, I mean, we, 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 we. I don't think we can require the federal government state. to pay us taxes. Do you? No, no, we can't. The employees. No, they have a they have a program, so they wouldn't be part of this. So. Well, right. Yeah. There is a question. The, the state employee <laughs> program is six weeks. Right. Right. And and this program, this proposed so program, would be a little bit more generous. So they would have to show that they have a program that is equivalent or better. Right. So, so you raise a different question, which is what's happening with the federal employees. And yeah, we've got a federal employee residing yeah. in the state. Do we have the? I mean, it's not going to make any difference in terms of the dollars, I assume, but it, if we can find out what the law yeah. is, I don't know what it is. Typically, we can't tax the federal government. We can tax federal employees, though. <coughs> it's income tax. Yeah, sorry. That's not payroll tax. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find out. We're guessing. Yeah, I'm we guessing. Uh, George and then Robin. So if it didn't save any money, why did they mess with the 12 weeks of parental bonding leave? Didn't save any money, but they cut down the benefit. You mean putting on the 16 limit? But, but the estimated expenditure was still exactly the same. Right. So it didn't start out this way. It started with a it's tighter cap. <clears throat> Instead of 16 weeks per couple, it was a smaller number of weeks per couple, and there was pushback, so it moved up to 16 weeks, and it turned out in the numbers that at 16 weeks it didn't matter to. So why would you do a smaller benefit? There's no cost saving. It's a really big question. Again, then there's that logic, Senate, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Do you remember the discussion? You're not required. To Yeah, actually, my question was going back to the uh, agreement with the state employees. And uh, I know if, if the legislature doesn't fund it or there's a different program, there was also something about employees would get a 0.25% salary increase or something like that. Wage increase. Wage right. increase. Right. Yes. So. Yes, what? Can, can you elaborate a little bit on? What the so the was. legislature has to provide the funding, which is what two point five million, I think, in, in that ballpark. That's typical to pay. Up. That's not nothing unusual about that. Yeah. So, so, but this is two point five to pay for this. No, I understand, new but I mean the fact that we have to provide funding is not uh -huh. unique to this. Uh, right. That's the way it always is. Right. Okay. Yeah. So if the legislature should choose not to provide that funding for this new benefit, then um, wages would go up 025 percent. But we'd have to fund that. Right, and that's the nature of the contract. That's what the Pay Act does, is it funds the contract. Right. And I under, if I'm recalling correctly, if our program were to pass, they would still get the 0.25%. Is that true? Did they? Oh, I don't know. 
I guess I was sort of asking that. I thought I read that. Hmm. That's what I heard also. Yeah. I because that's, that's what I basically read. saying that their program is not as generous as ours and they would have right. they would fall on ours. Yeah. Ours. So this yes. That would be another sort of indirect cost, I guess, to our program. At this you probably find out but yeah. what it actually said. Right. I, Question, federal employees. Question, state employees. Okay. Anything else? We'll get where we are. Yeah. Uh, things that people want to know that we haven't heard about. So, <clears throat> procedurally. Yep. This was just delayed on the floor one day. Yep. Um, do you know what? But, so general committee is going to be looking at it this afternoon. I think that's where Joyce is going to go when she's done with us. Um, they have Damien up there as well, who sort of knows the ins and outs of the bill. Um, I didn't feel that we needed to have him come in, and they need him. Um, and uh, they are going to take a position on the bill, most likely not to concur and get a conference committee. And that will come up tomorrow. Okay. Good. <coughs> And regardless, they need to change the dates. Right. No matter what dates need to change. And there needs some, to be an updated fiscal note and so on. As Joyce pointed out to me yesterday, everything changes. So it's not like, you know, the wage base is going to change, the cost of the benefits is going to change, the average weekly wage will change. All those things will change, but that it shouldn't result in a change in the tax rate. Um, I mean, it would be surprising if it did because the changes are small. Um, so that's. Uh, but she's going to update the fiscal note before there's a final vote on the bill. So, assuming it goes to conference committee, um, you know, they'll meet, they'll come up, they'll work from the two versions, um, probably more the Senate version, but they'll work from the two, and um, come up with a compromise, and we'll look at it. Um, I, again, I don't know if we'll take a position on it or not. We might, but we're not formally taking a position on this. Peter. I just is it so that the conference committee would logically be comprised on the House side of uh, folks from the general committee? It will be whatever the speaker decides. Um, I, I ask that because I remember a very robust discussion over what uh, happens if in a couple of years we're unsatisfied with our choice of using a third party private insurance administrator. And we talked a great deal about <coughs> that. I don't know that we ever resolved it, but it was an issue, I think, not just for myself, but uh, some way to measure success, so to say, or not success, and then decide, do we want to take it over, we being the state of Vermont? Yes, there is a piece of the bill that very yes. clearly states that after four years, okay. there's I a I was trying to find it. And yeah, it's towards the end. I just wanted that perspective to be represented, I guess, is the yeah. issue. And, <coughs> and that reminds me that I think that the other piece that's in this uh, bill is a study to determine how we go to mandatory TDI and and self-employed um, and self-employed. Self 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 yes, a lot of mm. people, but not a, not an issue. We felt like we could resolve right where we were right now. Right. Yes. Yeah, there are probably other studies in there as well. So I think those are all still in there. Great. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so this, I think this is going to be up tomorrow, I guess. Um, at least that's why we were asked to act quickly. Yeah. Uh, not that we're acting. Here, look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Um, so uh, people need a two-minute break. So um, I thought it would be good if we spent a little time on the uh, December 1st letter and um, Oh. Other side. Other side. Well, stand up and then you can do it. Oh. And then turn around and pull it out and shoot you right out. They can be a chapter seat, but some guy last year. Is that better? Is she a chapter seat? I think people stay off. So, Mark is here. He's going to talk about the Ed Fund balance sheet and teacher's health insurance in the December 1st letter. And Craig Folio, who is now the commissioner of taxes, um, is coming in at some point. And um, he had another meeting, so a schedule issue. Um, and he will also have a chance to talk about the letter 
um, just again, no decisions. We're just getting grounded in mm -hmm. what is going on. Okay. All right. So, um, uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to walk you through the December 1st um, Education Fund Outlook. Okay. And I've, um, Yes, I have five copies. Yeah, there's no balance sheet. I don't have a copy. It's kind of, it'll be there shortly. Everybody else want that? Yeah, I'm going to use one because I need to write on it. Oh, right. Come on. Yeah, two, I have two. You're coming this way? Yeah, I'm coming this way. Anybody else want to have her? What? Yeah, we yeah, want one. Everybody wants one. That's <laughs> probably the scribble on That's right. Yeah. I feel the right on this stuff. Can you put this stuff here? Yeah. We need one back. Oh, we still need. We need one more? Yeah, I guess so. Come on. Did they get one? Yes. She did. Okay. okay. There they all are. Okay. So okay. back. So I write January. All right. Walk us through. Okay, so, so um, I have to start out with the, the normal caveats we go through every year. This is the first look at what tax rates may be for 2020. Um, Brad's, Brad's over here, and I think he would agree with me that uh, the primary driver of the tax rates on the sheet is education spending. And at this point, education spending is, I would call, an educated guess. We won't actually know what board boards are going to be presenting to their voters um, in town meeting week until sometime in February around there. And at that point, we'll have a much, much better idea um, of what things look like. So um, keep that in mind when we're looking at these tax rates. Um, there's uncertainty around um, some of the spending things, and I'll go over that um, when we get down to there. And, I'm going to um, ask a Sure. I think that's probably a dumb question, but um, education spending is what, is that the same as education payment? Yes. So uh, yeah. did we change the name in it? We haven't changed the name. It's called an education payment. I don't, you know, the terminology isn't great because okay. education spending sounds like it could be budgets, it could be okay. number of tax rates based is, on. is the same thing. That's the, the same thing. thing. Okay. And so that that education payment number on line ten is yep. what drives the tax rates. Yep. So when I'm referring to education, education spending driving it, that's what we're talking about right there. Are you looking at line ten? Yeah, I'm looking at line ten. So um, the first thing that you notice is that the tax rates are projected given the spending assumptions that are built in here, both the homestead and the uh, non-homestead non property tax rates would go up by about six cents uh, this year, which is, which is quite a bit compared to what we've had for the last couple of years. And the first thing I will point you to on the education fund outlook is, um, can, can I control this from here? No. Can you get on the bottom? Just we can let you control. Uh -huh. We can arrange that for Okay. The first thing I want to bring your attention to is this number here, which would, would typically not be there. Now, if you remember at the end of the session last year, there was a disagreement between the House and Senate as to whether or not all of the surplus money in the education fund in FY20 should be used to, uh, or FY19 should be used to reduce tax rates in 2020. And the compromise was to, um, you ended up using a little over $11 million of that last year, and then the agreement was anything left over on the bottom line in 2020 would be would be left there and used to reduce tax rates in FY21. So right now, we are estimating that there's about $8 million available in undesignated money. So with the full reserve of 5%, with everything paid for in 2020, there's an additional $8.2 million right now available on the bottom line. Um, if you want to look down line 30, you can see that in FY 2020, there's $8.2 million left over. That money can would normally be have been baked into the tax rate for FY 21, but um, it hasn't been used yet this year. Okay. Everybody? So that's one that? difference. So that so was not included in the letter. Right. So right off right from the get-go, even, even though we're talking about a six cent tax rate increase, there's enough money there right now if you chose to use that money 
to bring the tax rate down by a penny, right off the, right off the start. In fact, right. we almost right. have to, yes. that we don't. Well, unless we leave money for next year. Yes. Yeah. You can do the same thing. Sure. The other thing to note is that that agreement was done. It was a one-year agreement, so there's no, there's nothing in the law. It was, right. it was a session law agreement that would be done this year because there was, a, you know, there was an unusually large surplus. Yeah. In FY. Um, Nineteen. Mark, can you remind me when we were here a year ago and we were looking at the December first letter and the first first one of these a year ago? What was the projected increase in, in tax rates? Mm -hmm. It was less than five. It was less than a six cent increase, but I can't remember. What but it wasn't was. zero. It wasn't zero. I think it was like four. That's what's in my head, but I don't know. Last year. Last year. Exactly a year ago, when we were in the same position yeah. from a year ago that we are right now. It was pretty flat. Yeah. No, it came so. in. It was a, it was three or four percent. And it ended up coming Not in flat. Three, three or four. Three or four percent, percent. Sense. spending increase. I'd actually yeah. like to know. Oh, oh so spending increase. You got it. Okay. I, it. I, yes, I did. Oh, you're talking about spending. Three point three point two four percent. I'm talking about the increase in tax rate. Oh, I don't, that I don't know. The, the increase in education spending was three point two as opposed yeah. to five percent. This year, so it would have been a lower increase. I don't know the rate. Yeah, so I, I would like three, to know what the what the projected yeah. increase in the December first letter was mm -hmm. for taxes. Yeah, for tax rate. Yeah. Tax rate. Yeah. It was about flat. The what? It was about flat. You think it was flat? Yeah, I don't think so. Okay. Can I ask you a question? This eight point two was that the conference committee at the end of last year? This money, even money on the bottom line. When yeah, yeah, I don't know if it was in the conference committee. Yeah, it was. Uh, so I, it, I didn't like it. It's like it's like a scare. It was like a right. scare tactic. No, it was it was. I mean, it, well, it, it's a difference of opinion about what you do when you have right. extra money on the bottom line. And my feeling has been, given the way the Ed Fund works, that you give it back to taxpayers. Um, but, uh, it's split the difference on this one. Does it help if I bring up the tax letter from last year? Yeah, I'll bring that in. Yeah. I'm going to bring it up. this. You think it's fine? Okay. Um, okay, I've got it right here if you want to hear it. Yeah, I do. Last year it was uh, the Homestead, they were projecting, uh, it was a buck 15 FY19, they were projecting a buck 50 for the Homestead. Okay. Income was 2.49 in 19, they were projecting 2.45. And the non Homestead, they were flat, buck 58, buck 58. Okay. And then if. They spent a lot more than 3.24 percent increase, <coughs> and then they started to move around. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, other. Okay, yeah. so I, I can just walk you through and explain to you what's driving the rates this yeah. time. Yeah. So the first thing is um, the non-property tax um, revenues that come into the education fund, which is about a third of the total revenues, is growing at about the rate of inflation. So when the non-property tax revenues grow at the rate of inflation and the education spending is growing at twice the rate of inflation, you've got to make up that money someplace and under the system we have that bank falls to the property tax. So that's one of the things that are, that are driving rates up so, this year. So you're talking about the, you said non-homestead or non-property tax? <clears throat> no, so on the, the, the sources on lines three to eight Three, so it's the non-property tax. Non-property okay. tax sources, yep. okay? okay? One third of the total, roughly, mm -hmm. check it lately, but it's usually yep. about one third. Yep. Um, that one third is growing at like 2.8%, yep. okay? Yep. You get spending growing at 5%, those revenues growing at 2.8%. Okay. You've got to make up for that money someplace. The place it's going to get made up on the end fund outlook without any new money coming in, it's going to be the property tax. Okay. So that's one factor driving things. Um, and then again, the, the, the remaining growth that we have. George has a question. But I thought with the Wayfair, we were expecting a more robust than that's increase. It has, and I, I think it's it, you know, the, the Ed Fund has done better than if we had the old system with the general fund transfer going at the rate of inflation. But um, overall, all those revenues together, because it's more than just sales tax, it's purchase and use tax, lottery, all those other revenues that you I think I have on a sheet. I think they grew by 2.6 percent overall. So, um, and I'm going to take something. And take it. Okay. There was a, I think we have a comparison between what the general fund transfer would have brought into the fund and what the um, what we actually are collecting in terms of sales taxes. I don't have it with me, but I think I could show you that at some point here. Okay. Um, 
Mm -hmm. So then in terms of spending, again, spending is the wild card here. Uh, this is an educated guess by the agency. Uh, we looked back on um, over a few years and I think in the last seven years it's been a little high for 44 times and a little low three times. So there's no systematic you know, error going on in there. It's just that it's very difficult in December to anticipate what schools are going to be spending um, or presenting to their voters in March. But there are some things that I can tell you about that we think are going to be driving costs. So the first one is um, school employees' health insurance costs. And there's two things going on there. One is the normal increase in premiums from one year to the next. And um, VHI has asked the Department of Financial Regulation to approve rates that would increase on average by about 12, 12 percent, 13, 13 percent this year. So that's a, that's a pretty big increase um, in one year. Um, they've also now, the, the second part of this is the um, statewide contract that was just negotiated um, while you were away. Um, based on the terms of, and we don't know this for certain, but based on the terms of the contract, which included changes to eligibility, increases in benefits for support staff, changes in out-of-pocket mechanisms, and first dollar coverage, all those kind of things you look at in terms of health care, we think that it's probably going to be a cost driver. In other words, health insurance is going to go up as a result of that. And, um, I think that the Department of Finance and Regulation is going to be re-examining the rates that VHI requested for FY21 in view of the new contract. So they may actually end up going up above the 13% average. Um, so that's, that's one big piece of things. I'm not an expert in this area. Um, no one might work to my office can talk to you in more detail about it if you're interested, but um, that's, that's one of the big drivers here. Um, another driver is um, special education aid. Uh, you know we passed a provision of law, um, Act 173, a couple of years ago that was going to move us from a reimbursement system to a census-based block grant and save money. That provision's been delayed for a number of reasons. And um, this year the request for um, special education aid is up also about 5%. So um, where there was a hope and anticipation that there might be some savings in that area in prior years, um, that's, been, that's been pushed out a little bit. And again, I, you know, I usually point out when I'm talking about this is just changing to a census grant from a reimbursement model doesn't necessarily save money. I think it would be likely to save some, but it's a federally mandated expenditure. School districts have to spend whatever they spend regardless of what they get in terms of aid. But um, that was one area where we were anticipating some, some savings, and that hasn't happened yet. And then um, the, the third area is um, school construction costs. You may have been reading about this, but I've been anecdotally seeing a lot of evidence um, around the state that um, because of deferred maintenance, because of changes coming about because of Act 46, um, a lot of school boards are looking at um, issuing bonds for school construction projects. Um, I took a look at this over the summer, and um, the uh, Vermont Municipal Bond Bank um, I got information on what they had loaned out to school districts since, since 2007, which is the last year that state aid was available, or the, the year the moratorium went into a place. We still gave state aid since then, but no new we, projects. We're still giving state aid for then for emergency projects and that kind of thing. No, we and, had to pay and off. And we had a backlog, <laughs> yeah. large backlog of paying off. But nothing but, new. Yeah. That's right. But from, from 2007 up to 2019, they had loaned out about 200 and. $25 million. Um, South Burlington is going to be putting a block for $209 million. Just South Burlington alone this session. Um, and there are a number of other districts, including Harwood and a few in the South, that are going to be putting pretty sizable bonds up for a vote. And so that, that's likely to have an impact on spending. And you know, it's only debt service that comes into the end fund every year. It's not $209 million all at once. It's over time. But uh, if, if this is a trend, and there's going to be more requests for this kind of funding going forward. It's going to be a pressure going forward. Um, Bur Burlington and um, Winooski passed bonds last year, mm -hmm. significant ones that will be baked in now. So am I understanding that if, when Burlington and Winooski and South Burlington, everybody passes the bond, we all pay into paying it back? It goes because it goes, goes into the 
the rate, the that, statewide rate? Right. The, the, debt, the debt service on a blind becomes part of your education spending per pupil. So your tax rate in the district that's approving the bond, their tax rate will go well, up. I know their tax but rate. no district raises on their homestead tax everything they spend. So yes, there will be a draw from the education funding. It's going to vary between yeah. towns. Yeah. And Depending on the income of the town <laughs> yes, and, yeah. right. and the property value. And yeah. it's going to draw from the non-homestead payers too. And, and it's yeah. not subject to the excess debt spending threshold. If it's, a, if it's, a, if it's approved. Approved by whom? By, uh, by the nine. agency of education. Oh, I see. Okay. So if the, if the agency, of, if the other, you know, you can't go out and build a, you know, test swim pool and tennis courts or something, you may not get approved. Um, you know, in order to get exempt from the excess pension penalty, you have to ask for approval on it and then it's subtracted out. Know, right? So, um, what else on um, school construction costs? Do you have a question? No, the, it's the approval by the agency of it. Yeah. Not the state. Um, it's the, 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 the agency of education. Yeah. Now the voters have to approve it in any event. Yeah, the voters have to approve it in the first place. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Um, again, that that's it's sort of like um, it's not going to hit all at once. It, it'll hit over time as they go. But they're usually twenty to thirty year bonds. Yeah. So as they come on, it'll it'll, it'll accumulate before it dries up. Um, one thing I wanted to point out, because there's been a lot of confusion over in the summer, is that we used to provide 30% uh, state aid to districts that had approved capital spending. That money didn't, had, had limited the impact on tax rates because it was money coming outside of the education fund. There's no more money right now going in that way. There's no more money coming out of the capital bill or the general fund to pay for this. So it would all be within the education fund. But as I pointed out when I started, one third of the money in the education fund is non-property tax money. So in a sense, you are getting aid okay. and when you pay for, a school, pay for a school. It's just paid for within the education fund, which affects everybody that's paying property taxes as opposed to coming from outside. But in a sense, it, 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 it provides more help to a low wealth, low income district than it does to a high property wealth, high income district because one district will be paying a bigger percentage of that cost themselves. Mm -hmm. Jim. Yeah. Just a little while back, Mark, when you started this section, we talked about um, potential um, emergency construction aid. Mm -hmm. Is there? Are we likely to see any of that this calendar year? Um, I, I think there's some every year. Um, I don't okay. follow it very closely. I can go but, look, but it's things like leaky roofs in your furnace, yeah. die, and this things is, like that. So this year, last year, year before, it's just kind of normal, normal, comparatively yeah. speaking. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have uh, I have those figures back. Yeah, no, okay. If, it's, if there's no radical change, I yeah, no, 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 no. Are those things that districts go into debt to do, typically? Um, it, it depends how big they are. They can, yeah. They can, yeah. 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 Um, other factors that are driving. Cynthia's got a question. No, oh, it's sorry. a question about one of the components. Yeah. I don't want to stop you if you have a regular. Okay, well, I just yeah. have a few odd things in there. There are things that come up every year. Um, there was a significant amount of non-recurring money that was used in um, 2020 last year in order to get through that $11 million, which is basically has to be made up. So that's another pressure on the tax rate this year. Um, there's nothing in the sheet right now for prior year reversions. Um, it's the great, great out, great out area uh, on the balance okay. sheet. Great out. Oh, yes. Yeah. So right here. Yep. Usually, you know, th that's money that will be coming forward from FY2020 once the year's closed. The administration makes a recommendation in the budget adjustment for money to come back. So in this year's budget adjustment, they have recommended that, where am I here, that this $3.3 million dollars will come back into the fund and be available. There will also be some money here. Usually don't book it this early, but um, I've taken a look at that, and I think you have me coming in tomorrow to talk about the budget adjustment. So we went back and looked at reversions since 2005. Yeah. There's been some reversion every year. It's averaged about seven or eight million dollars, although a lot of that has been driven by the last couple of years. But anyway, it's, a, it's another factor that you can keep in mind that will have a downward pressure on the tax rate. So in addition to the 8.2 that we set aside, there's something that's going to be filled in on line 22 that we don't know what 
Yeah, we, 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 we will know until it's done for a year <laughs> for a year from now when the administration submits a budget adjustment in the following year. But there have been years when we've carried money there in anticipation of mm. the receipt of the month of the following year. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. And then the two things that go on every year, we, we're continuing to have declining enrollment, um, and that you know doesn't affect um, overall spending or how much total property tax money we bring in, but it affects tax rates and you know, who's paying. So in other words, it can shift the burden between towns. And um, property, statewide property values um, are growing again, but they're, they're kind of anemic. They're growing at a, around the rate of inflation, not, not what we were like two and a half percent years ago. roughly, or what? Um, yeah, pro less than three less than three percent. Less than three percent. And it, there's a very um, disparate impact across the state. Some areas of the state are actually um, declining in value, and other, sta other parts of the state are growing. It's sort of the same as um, enrollment. Depends on where, which part of the state you're in, how you're being affected by it. But um, right. I, I've been noticed in the, the last year's annual report, there's a, there's a record number of districts that have CLAs that are greater than one, which means that the value of the property on the town's books, the assessed value, is actually higher than the state has determined the fair market value to be. I think you're, you know, St. John's is one of them. Yeah, we're at 107. So, um, so anyway, and again, that, that doesn't, that, you know, it doesn't change how much money we need to raise, and how much taxes are paid, but it does make the tax rate look better when the grand list values are growing. Right. When the base is growing, you having to raise the tax over, so the tax rate at any given level of revenue is going to be lower. And what, um, uh, the grand list value growth, was that about the same last year? Um, Less than 3%. I think it's a little higher this year than it was last year. Um, it's, it's been picking up, but you know, I remember a lot. I, I can look. No, I remember a couple of years ago the, the you know the consensus forecast for property values had it, had it turning up and growing faster. And it's it's been really sluggish. Yeah. So. Now can I ask one? Yeah. Yes, you may. Um, Mark, going up to line one B. Uh, yeah, one one B. The under sources, mm -hmm. which we are now calling the Homestead Property Tax Credit. Yes. Um, my recollection is not last year, but the year before when we made changes, we made a number of changes, and my recollection is we changed some aspects about the um, this property tax credit program, and we were going to phase them in over a couple of years, and maybe this is something we did in here and it didn't make it through the whole process. I'm just, I thought we changed something about the maximum payment that you could get, um, Am I completely almost. off base? Almost. Yes. Yeah. The, ho the, ho the homeowner rebate. Right? The homeowner rebate, yes. yes. Yeah. So the homeowner rebate um, was split split yep. up into two separate parts. It was always combined. Right, the municipal and yeah. the ed fund. Right. No? Oh, no, finish that thought. I have another one. Right. It's, it's, yeah, so, so it, we, we, it's basically it was the same program and the parameters remained the same. We just split up into two components. So the education part of it was capped, I think, at 5600 on the homeowner rebate. Is that right? You're on the 8,000, and the remainder of it, up to the 8,000, was kept on the municipal side. So it just it just separated them out, so it's a little bit more transparent. I think what was going on. But, you know. So the thing I'm remembering is um, the I'm not forgetting what it's called, but the the people who are between 90,000 and 100 and whatever the ceiling is, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and it it was uh, we. We reduced the property value that they could um, take from five hundred thousand to four hundred. Yes, that's what I understand. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that we phased it in over two yes. years because yes. the bump was right. too big. Yes, that's what yes. you're talking. That's about. what I'm thinking do about. Do you remember that? You do. You do. <laughs> what did but we do? Did we do that? We go up from five hundred down to four hundred. But we did it in, in increments. Didn't we? Or, or we decided no. not to do the no, second increment. No, I don't increment. think we didn't do the increment. No, we went straight. She just did it. I'm just, I, I was like guessing. <laughs> um, <laughs> sure, Chloe Wexler from the Joint Fiscal Office. Um, in uh, uh, two years ago, um, you did change both of those house site caps from 500000 to 400000 for the people who are under $90,000. And the people that are above $90,000 the house site cap was changed from 250, 250 to, to 225. 
and there was and no we went to 200. We and and that has never occurred. That we never went to 200. No. We did the two. So that was the thing we were talking. We went to two and a yeah. quarter, but not to 200. Okay, so so we did part of that, but it actually did happen. It went all the way through. My question yes. is, were did those changes in anybody's mind have any effect on um, the? The cost of that program, I mean, I'm still seeing, seeing it go up by, you know, three million, three million, three million. But I'm just, and it might just be a marginal change. But um, no, there, was, there, was, there was a significant uh, you know. oh, yeah, cost. Like there was a significant cost reduction. Yes, yeah, six okay. or seven million dollars yeah. okay. in the year of implementation. Okay. And then since then, it's just been normal growth. Okay. Okay. We right. would have to see FY18. Yeah, I know. That's I, that, I just couldn't remember. I couldn't remember. Yeah, the okay. changes were done retroactively. Actually. Okay. Um, for FY18. Okay, because you're looking back. And, and then okay. um, what Mark was talking about, the split out between... I remember um, that, yeah. Th yeah. That actually, FY20 is the first year that that has actually um, been been done on the checks that went out this year. Well, last year, 2019. <laughs> But that didn't change people's benefit. No. That changed where, where it is in the yeah. fund and the general fund. The yeah, other one did change what people got as an adjustment. I mean, adjustment. I would I would actually mm -hmm. like to see what we did and what it meant in some sense. Yeah. Because um, we spent a lot of time with Mr. Feldman's those that wonderful chart that he had, and that mm -hmm. those charts and gra the, the the tables would be different now because of what we did. And I'd like to understand how they're different. Um, even if it's just writing down what everybody just said, because I wrote it down, but I'm not sure I wrote it down right. Yeah, I, can, um, I can so, follow up with So you I would that. just like, yeah, I just, yeah. that might just be for me. I just want to really get it straight in my head. Thank and I you. think in the House we went from 250 to 200, and I know. the Senate went to, after that, 250. And see, I always forget about the Senate. The I remember what yeah. we did, but I can't I keep in my mind in what, what the Senate does. Yeah. So. Good, good memory on it, though. Um, other questions? Anything else that you want to go over? This, this sheet, uh, I'm looking through the sheet now. It's actually very helpful. Your fiscal uh, note. Your fiscal note. Fiscal note. Yeah. Great. Um, there's a lot in there. You know. um, and last year's letter, is that somewhere? That's posted somewhere in here, right? It's. I pulled it up from last year's agenda, but I can add it to today. Yeah, one way to put it on the good. So. History on it. Um, Mark, do you have other things for us? Um, no, I don't think so. Unless you have any questions. Um, okay. Nobody? Okay. Um, hey, Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, we're <coughs> happy to have you here. Um, happy to be here. You come join us and so we have both letters. We have this year's and last year's up here somewhere. I have them up the, the last year's letter has not been attached to today yet. I'm doing that. Okay. Good. Uh, welcome to the committee. And um, we've had Mark go through the Ed Fund balance sheet and his fiscal note and um, happy to hear from you. Sure. Uh, yeah, Craig Bolio, Tax Commissioner. Um, so we uh, we issued the letter uh, as prescribed by statute. Um, the results uh, are potentially concerning for affordability um, in terms of the yield, the property yield, uh, going up to uh, 10,883 from 10,648. Income yield increasing from 13,396 uh, to 13,396 from 13,081. Uh, which translates to uh, five and a half cents on the average homestead rate and a non homestead rate of six cents for the projection. Yeah. yeah. So, we do, does the tax department just do a calculation based on the numbers, the estimates that come from the Agency of Education? I mean, you're just plug it, plugging in what you're getting? And yes, that's essentially correct, yes. Uh, sure, Jake Feldman, uh, Tax Department. There's numbers from the Agency of Education uh, that uh, has been. Uh, if you're going to testify, Jake, I'm going to have you come up here and testify. Okay, okay? essentially correct, yes. Okay. Thank you. One other thing that, that should be noted um, that we had not accounted for uh, potential increased costs from the, the teacher health care contract. So um, we would like to. Um, 
I know that the agency of Ed is, is currently uh, working on getting new estimates. Um, I'm hopeful that we will uh, have updated estimates before the e-board meeting. So the December 1st letter doesn't have anything for increased health care costs? Or I, I don't know if I would the... say it doesn't have anything, okay. but um, I think that, that the Agency of Education, and I don't want to speak for them, um, but I think that the Agency of Education had uh, taken the, the best information that they had at that time. Okay, so and there's so, something, and we've got updated information. Right, so I think the, the okay. ask is to go back out and see if there, there needs to be an update. All right. I mean, we're going to have better information on the budgets that boards are going to submit in a couple weeks anyway. Correct. Um, so I don't know if it makes sense to do interim updates, you know, because we're, we're going to have actually some good information. It's up, up to the committee that my sense is. Yep. Have that. They're in by February 1, usually, right? Yeah. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's always a rolling process. We get some information yes. and then there's always some information that's missing but um all right uh questions for anything else you want to share with us thanks for having me great thank you right. jake did you want to come up and join us or i don't want to put you on the spot but if you have anything you'd like to add and you're welcome um, to come if in there's any sit. technical questions about the letter um, if you're going to Speak once you come on after. <laughs> uh, Jake Feldman, Senior Fiscal Analyst, Tax Department. Um, if you have any technical questions about the letter, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Anybody got anything you want to understand? Got your question answered. I, I feel like it was answered. Okay, very good. Good. Thank All right, great. Thanks. Very good. Um, Brad, did you have anything you want to add? You want to join us for a minute? I'll, I'll be happy to join you. Yeah. Answer questions. Okay. Go over the timing on all these things as well for me, um, sure. so that we understand what we're going to get. More. Brad James, Agency of Education. Um, so what we're talking about right now are our preliminary budgets that uh, we've asked business managers to send to us once they are board approved. Um, I can't remember the date we have on there. Is February 1 or February 15th? I can make it February 1 because I don't think it's gone out yet. I think it goes tomorrow. Oh, okay. um, and usually, usually we get maybe 25% to, th to a third and right around that time period. Mm -hmm sometimes some of the bigger districts and then we continue to get new budgets in, in board approved budgets as, as time progresses and that's when I keep coming back to you mm -hmm. and saying this is where this group of districts were mm -hmm. last year versus where they are this year and we get a better idea of what's happened yeah. and we start making better projections. Right now um, the numbers that, that Mark was referencing came from my discussion with business managers as to what, what they anticipated their, their budget going to be back in November. So it was, it was pretty early in the process, but a lot of them were looking at construction costs, renovation costs. Uh, there was the health care thing. Some some built in the potential for the settlement to go the way it went. Some did not in the numbers I saw. I had, I had I received numbers from 23 districts, some of them fairly sizable. I think it, if I recall correctly, I've thought we had those 23 districts represented 40 to 45 percent of the education spending. So it was a sizable piece. And that's where that, that increase of roughly 5% came from the education fund that was just sent with one letter. Um, and again, as Mark pointed out, um, it's an educated guess at the moment, and we will start um, honing on that a little bit more as time progresses. And so we should be starting to see numbers in three or four weeks that, to get a good idea of what's going on. And those numbers will have been, have that settlement, that healthcare settlement built into it. Um, I did talk to some business managers. Some business managers said it's not going to impact them because of what they've already done. Others say it's a big impact. So it's it's kind of all over the place. So that's kind of the timing on the preliminary budget data as we move yeah. towards So the earliest that you'd have something for us would be first week in February. Or early right? February, yes. Yeah. yes. And, and again, well, you know, again, typically it's 25 to 30 yeah. percent of the districts. Are, yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
yeah. but some of them are the larger districts. Yeah. yeah, and it kind of gives you an idea of whether the educated guess was yeah, yeah, well, even close. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. hopefully it was. Yeah, good. Other questions? Anyone's got? Okay, Peter, and then Cynthia. I, I was uh, with my seatmate in the city of Barrie invited to come to the mer merged uh, school district board meeting recently and the superintendent uh, uh, struck a bit of fear into both of us because I understand the agency was changing or proposing to change, this goes back to special ed essentially, the way in which uh, schools may uh, count um, for any kind of special treatment, the percentage of folks who are on IEPs or in the category called special ed. And he said if that change goes forward, uh, the city of Barry is going to see a significant reduction in the portion that the state picks up of that cost. And then there's the revision of the meaning of an equalized pupil. That, uh, is also on top of that. And I'm, I'm just trying to struggle. I don't want to poach in terms of policy issues of another committee, but at the same time, it's going to affect, I assume, the figures I see here in my role uh, in Ways and Means. And I have to try and sort out how much is because the uh, accounting of heads has been revised and how much is actual increases in resources, even if you didn't change the rules of counting. I'm not sure it's the counting of heads. If it's, if it's what I'm thinking of, there was a discussion as to what what cost per student was eligible when, there, when they were sent to a, to an outside aid entity outside of the school district. Um, because what the what the law says is that part of your tuition your tuition rate, which is what we we uh, reimburse on, is general education. That's not reimbursable. And, I, and I, there, there was a lot of discussion about that. That may be what you're referencing, Maybe. where where the law says this, and we weren't necessarily doing that, mm -hmm. and districts weren't doing that. And there was a whole big pushback over the, over the course of the summer. Mm -hmm. um, where had, had that gone forward, then what hap would have happened is that, that the district costs would have stayed the same, mm -hmm. your district costs, but the reimbursable portion mm -hmm. would have increased. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're referencing, Indeed. I think. It's, it's subtle, but I think okay. I think that's what you're after. That was pulled back by the by the secretary, um, and because he wanted to focus more on other things as opposed to having a big battle about that right mm -hmm. now. So I, I think that's what you're, what you're referencing. Um, the other part was change and equalize. Oh, oh, this, this, this is yeah. This is with the waiting say This I, I believe you all are meeting with Tammy Colby tomorrow mm -hmm. or Wednesday. Okay. Okay. Well, I'll hold okay. it then. I, well, well, basically, what what they're looking at are, are different. Are changing the, the waiting factors of current statute plus adding in some new ones. And one of the things that happens when you do that is, it. A lot of people tend to think that if you change the number of equalized people you get, you get more money. That's not the way the funding system works. You get whatever your district votes on, that's what you get. The, yeah. the pupil count drives the tax rate. Yeah. The tax rate. If you're, if this goes through as, as they're talking about, and you're in a district that suddenly gets more equalized people because they're changing waiting factors, that means your tax rate goes down, but that means somebody else's tax rate has gone up. So it's, it's a zero sum game, basically, in okay. terms of pupil count. Um, and the idea behind it, contrary to what I heard on the radio driving in, that maybe yell at my car. Um, <laughs> 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 you were blamed a messenger. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness. Uh, I, was, I was pounding on the steering wheel. Like, <laughs> um, Fourth, I was on my back road. I had just gotten in the car. <laughs> um, but uh, that if, if your equalized blue count doesn't change, or your changes increases, it doesn't mean that you get more money, as I said. Um, what it does do is it the idea behind this to decrease your tax rate so that you can increase your tax and capacity so you can bring in more money mm. to apply to these different categories of students that cost more. That's that's the concept behind behind these additional weights that they're looking at. And Tam Tammy Cole will be going into that quite a bit, I think, tomorrow. Yeah. But it did come across wrong on the radio. <laughs> that's Peter Herschel on BP. Oh, yeah. oh, okay. I just, I missed it. So, yeah. Yeah, it's Friday or yeah. Thursday morning last week. It's, it's, you know, it's a big study. It, it is a big study. Um, oh. they, they, they spent a lot of time on it. Yeah. I spent a lot of time getting them information. So yeah. I have not read the whole thing yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, just 
if I wanted to understand more about the health insurance settlement, which is a factor in this, what report would I look at, or who would I go to? Would that be Nolan, or who would? I, would I think I think that would be Nolan. I know okay. I know very little about. No, I know I'm not yeah. I'm not no, asking I think, you. I, think, I just I want guidance about. Okay. I think I think it would be Nolan. Okay, because Mark, you said Nolan. Yeah, Nolan. Okay. Yeah, Nolan's been okay. Thank you. I just know how it would be. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions for Brad? Jim. This is not so much a tax question in the first instance, but it becomes one. The, um, the, the issue of changing from per pupil to, to um, census based. Special education. Okay. Yeah, right. Special ed. Yeah, that. Um, you alluded to reasons why that's not going forward yet, I guess. But I'm. I'm curious, outside of the jurisdiction of, of this committee, whether there's serious thinking on whether it's a good idea after all, based on um, educational outcomes. I'm just curious if that's part of the discussion and we uh, can anticipate waiting for a while before that. I, I think, again, I, and I think, I think Tammy Colby will be discussing this because part of her charge was okay. to look at special education. That's fine. Um, my perspective is that there were a lot of districts that wanted to block grants. They yeah. kept asking for it, and then once they saw what it had, they started exactly. getting cold feet. Because it's true. One, one of the things is that, that the, the block grant is going out based on your average daily membership and through your yeah. average yeah. that. Yeah. And so it's going out your total student count. So if you have a very high percentage of special ed kids versus another SU that has a very low percentage, you're not necessarily going to have enough money, whereas they will. Yeah, no. So, so is there, there are issues with that. Okay. We're going to see how it works out. And she's, I think she will be addressing okay, that. Okay, so. well, that's a good explanation. And it's, um, and it's understanding. You know? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, he says with a smile. Other questions? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyone has? I've got one. Um, the target accounts. What's the status of the target accounts? That's pretty well, I would need to check exactly where it is, but that's pretty well, um, Pushed out there now. I think I think not everyone is using it, but I think everybody's. They have to crosswalk to it. I don't think they're using it quite yet. Um, they're, they're still. Can I explain the, the, what it is for. Oh, I'm sorry. Order. Chart of accounts. The uniform chart of accounts was was set up for. Um, and again, it's not really my area. It's like quite a few years ago. Yeah, quite we a few years ago. It took yeah, a while. Like, I don't know. Five, maybe. <laughs> Seven, maybe. Eight. Seven. Okay. I think I think it's one started. And it was it, it was it was a charge, and it was it was, it was a group of business managers who worked with some of our folks in the agency, yeah. so that all the districts were set test, hopefully saying the same thing, but at least they're using the same system. Yeah. Whereas there would hit before there were like four or five different ones people use, and this is not the accounting system itself. This is the actual chart of accounts, how they how they coded things. So it's it's pretty well impact or pushed out there now at this point. Um, it, you, there's still that human discussion about well, is this this or is it this, and you may get different things. But it's it's much better than it was. We we're not at the point yet where where, where we can reach out and do it. Not everybody has fully implemented with the new um, accounting system. The the um, uh, powers of the SS and DDMS, oh, whatever right. all those letters are. <laughs> okay. Um, no idea what that is. Yeah, I, all right, that's I, okay. It's, it's that's long. Right. Um, yeah. So, but that, but that's what, what folks are working on now. And I think probably roughly half the schools have either implemented that, so they're they're in the new system now, along with the new chart of accounts, and I'm probably either with it or are working on implementing it right now. And the others are just about to come in in the next year. So. Next year being twenty two. So I think I think I might I might be off by year. Maybe um, maybe this coming year. Um, so is it accurate to say it's going to be about ten years from? Yeah. <laughs> it's a long Give or take a decade. The what? Give or take a decade. Give or take a decade. Is it going to make a difference? I think ultimately it will. I don't think it will right away. Um, I, and this is just from what I'm hearing and seeing from folks. Um, some folks are having issues with it, but they're, they're figuring them out. There's been more help coming into it. I think it will be easier for us to reach out and get information a little bit more easily. I think it will help everybody else um, out in the field. And so cut, after, after they go through all the laborious hours of getting to the point where they can use it smoothly, I think at that point then we'll start cutting down people's work and we can pull things in as opposed to having Individual things for every school district. Other questions anyone has? 